Welcome to Orchestrate All the Things. I'm George Anadiotis and we'll be connecting the dots together. Stories about technology, data, AI, and media, and how they flow into each other, shaping our lives. For many organizations today, data management comes down to handing over the data to one of the big five data vendors, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, and Google, plus Snowflake and Databricks. But analysts David Vellante and George Gilbert believe that the needs of modern data applications, coupled with the evolution of open storage management, may lead to the emergence of what they call the sixth data platform. The sixth data platform hypothesis is that open data formats may enable interoperability, leading the transition away from vertically integrated vendor-controlled platforms towards independent management of data storage and permissions. It's an interesting scenario and one that could benefit users by forcing vendors to compete for every workload based on the business value delivered, irrespective of lock-in. But how close are we really to realizing this? To answer this question, we have to examine open data formats and their interoperability potential across clouds and formats, as well as on the semantics and governance layer. We caught up with Peter Corliss and Alex Merced to talk about all of that. I hope you will enjoy this. If you like my work on Orchestrate All The Things, you can subscribe to my podcast, available on all major platforms, my self-published newsletter, also syndicated on Substack, Hackernoon, Medium, and DZone, or follow Orchestrate All The Things on your social media of choice. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate at uh, Dremio. And basically, um, my role at Dremio is, well, one to help enable people in using the Dremio, but mo- more of my role has really been in helping educate and advocate for the data lake house architecture, and particularly for just helping educate people on table formats in particular. So a lot of the articles and stuff that I've written has really been on sort of what are the different formats, what are the different considerations of the different formats. Now I'm starting to move more into sort of like, okay, now people know what the formats are, and now let's talk more about implementation and the tooling around that. So things like Project Nessie, that enable more like Git-like operations on, on Iceberg and, and Dremio, which really kind of enables sort of a center point of access for a, a lake house. And just kind of talking about how to put all these things together that kind of really have an e- not only a fast, performant, easy to use lake house that kind of unites everything and th- fulfills the promise of what day lake houses me- were meant to be. Cool, thank you. I'm Peter Corliss, been around Silicon Valley for a long while, but most recently I am at uh, StarTree, where I'm the director of product marketing. And before that, I was at SillaDB and also Aerospike. So I've been both on both the OLTP side as well as the OLAP side. And I'm just taking a look at the kind of meta patterns that are emerging in real world architectures. I've been writing up a lot of case studies, and it's interesting to see the patterns of what's being adopted by users in the real world. And sometimes that that aligns with what us as vendors say, and sometimes it's radically different. So that's where a lot of the thoughts I have today come from. Okay, well, great. Thank you, Peter. And then, all right, let's, uh, I thought maybe it's good to start with a little bit of uh, history. That's uh, obviously table stakes for for both of you, but um, maybe not necessarily for everyone who may be listening in. So I thought, it may be a good idea to sort of retrace, let's say, maybe the last 10 years or so in data management. So going from, let's say, traditional data warehouses to Hadoop and to cloud storage and eventually data lake houses and, well, everything else. Sure. I I love the pun, by the way, the table stakes pun. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't intentional. (laughs) But I think that that's a great point, is that tables themselves are not all one thing anymore, right? We have highly optimized row stores, highly optimized column stores, some databases that purport to support both. And then even within a row store or a column store format, there's so many options to choose from. What are you optimizing for is a key thing. Like for instance, this morning I was listening to Lance, which is a new format that's coming out of Lance DB. And they're focusing upon very large blobs and making a column store that's aligned with machine learning. Now, not everybody is doing machine learning, but when that's important, they believe that they have some advantages there. And that's just one example out of thousands that are out now. And I'd like to cede to Alex because I think he's knee deep in in the table formats right now. 
Yeah, so I agree. Like, there's a lot of really interesting sort of new projects coming along, like Apache Paimon and LanceDB. But kind of going back to sort of like, where did this all come from? Basically, we go back to like you mentioned traditional data warehouses, where basically, basically you had this physical infrastructure on premise in your in your office, and then basically you had an issue with scaling. Like, if I needed more storage, well, I have to buy a node, and I'm getting this computer. I don't need when I need storage. When I need compute, I still got to get extra storage. So. One, you, this the scaling was more expensive, and two, you couldn't just scale at the drop of a hat. You kind of have to plan, okay, how many nodes am I going to need ahead of time? So this kind of caused a lot of tension, and that's kind of what led to the impetus of sort of cloud data warehouses. So Snowflake allowing you to say, hey, you know, we'll separate your compute and, you, and your storage, and you can pay for what you need here in the cloud. But you still have to kind of move your data into the data warehouse. You still have to move it into Snowflake. So you're still having duplicative data of data in your data lake and data in your data warehouse. So that's the idea of a data lake house being like, hey, you know what? It's We love this decoupling of compute and storage. We love the cloud, but wouldn't it be nice if we don't have to duplicate the data and we can just operate over the data store you already have, your data lake, and then just take all that data warehouse functionality and start trying to move it on there, which has been a tall order because in the earliest stages of the data lake, you had HDFS, where you had like on-prem data lakes with a similar issue as you had with on-prem data warehouses. But in order to enable SQL in, in the data warehouse, I mean, in the data lake, because what happened was you had you had Hadoop had a framework called MapReduce, which was really difficult to write for. So then they came out with Apache Hive, which would take SQL and translate it to MapReduce jobs. And in order to have SQL, though, you need tables. So you got to figure out how do I represent a table on the data lake? And Hive decided to do that through a, a directory structure, saying, hey, this folder is a table, and any subfolder is a partition. We'll track those folders in the Hive Metastore, and then that's how we're going to define a table. And that worked. That, that enabled Hive's ultimate goal, which is to be able to write SQL, translate it to MapReduce. But there was still a lot, like, it was still really hard to do granular, granular, more granular updates and deletes, uh, do them with sort of asset guarantees. There's all these things that are still lacking from a traditional sort of data warehouse or database environment. That made it sort of impractical to really make the data lake your home hey, of all I, your data. Yep. I go for it. On this, for instance, if you go back a decade or more, partitioning wasn't a guarantee, right? Automatic mm -hmm. partitioning, auto sharding, right? And that's one of the things that's become a presumption over the past decade is that your database will be auto partitioning, auto sharding, uh, you know, auto balancing. All of those things came al along with the movement to cloud services. And it and databases used to be far more oriented towards files in a file system. And these days you're being presented with an API to get your data. And it's more the virtual data catalog as opposed to physical files in a file system that you're managing, you're backing up and rotating and all the rest of that kind of stuff. So I think that that was one of the advantages of going to the cloud is making it so that you weren't so hands-on with the file system underneath. So I think that there's, the, and, and with that then means that the systems themselves had to become those administers. They had to become very intelligent on how they did sharding and partitioning and distribution and replication. And all of that has become a requirement. Like that's a baseline requirement these days if you're building a big distributed system. And that's that's sort of like where we're at right now with like in the data lake house space, because that's basically now you... The databases and the data warehouses have automated all this stuff in the cloud. And now, you, like you said, that's like assumed. But in, in the data lake house world, that's still not quite there yet. Like you have Apache iceberg tables or Delta Lake tables. It's not assumed that they're just going to automatically partition themselves and all this stuff. That's where all these data management systems come in. Like this is what services like Tabular and Dremio now provide for like Apache iceberg tables or, or, or Databricks has different uh, services that they provide on for the, uh, Delta Lake tables or One House provides for Apache hoodie tables. And that's sort of like the next like sort of big competition in the data lake house space because now, okay, everyone's agreed. I wasn't quite the right solution. So let's move to these newer formats that do kind of address that Apache iceberg, Apache hoodie and Delta Lake. But now, okay, how, what, where are the services that allow us to, to, to maintain partitioning, to maintain compaction, to sort these data files and do all that data management. Where's that going to come from? Because there isn't this unified system now. It's all decoupled and, 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 and modular. And, in that, it's very interesting because, like, with in the Delta Lake world, you're kind of just stuck with one option. Databricks is kind of provides all those services, and there really isn't like a good alternative for Delta Lake. So it's like oftentimes with Delta Lake, you really kind of are marrying Databricks. While with like Apache Iceberg, you have Tabular, you have Dremio, 
Snowflake has just gotten into the table management game and AWS just got into the table management game uh, for not just being a catalog, but also managing the tables under the hood and the data files underneath. And then one house is starting to make some splashes with their new one table project, aiming more attention towards the, the, the hoodie project. So it's going to be an interesting sort of battle the next couple of years over that. Yeah, and I think the other thing that is becoming presumed in the platform is that things like normalization, sanitation, cleanse, cleansing of data, right? Sanity of data, that is becoming now more of a core feature that's required because nobody wants to manage like a data swamp, right? People really do want to have their tables normalized, sanitized against each other, that he has one customer record that's kind of universal. And we get into things like silver and gold tables, like how pure is pure. And I think that that's another thing that's been a movement in recent days, whereas in the past, all of that was a completely manual head scratching thing that the high priests of SQL would answer for you. Like, when is my data actually going to be ready for an analytics? And it took a long while back in the day. So I think that's another kind of service that's also required. And I want to throw on top of this is that not only has there been this move towards the automation of a lot of these kind of data janitorial services, but now there's the movement from batch to real time, where we're seeing now like a good quarter of some organization's data is streaming data. And that is a relentless advance towards moving from reports that'll be ready in an hour and reports that'll be ready in a day towards reports that'll be ready in seconds or are always up to date to the second, right? And I think that that requires a whole different level of approach because whenever you're optimizing something, you're optimizing for something and you're optimizing away from something else. And the, the techniques and efficiencies that you look for in batch data may actually be an anti-pattern for real-time analytics. True, but actually before we get to the part about real-time analytics, let's revisit a little bit because to me, and I was just telling uh, Alex earlier before you joined, uh, Peter, that you know it's been a while that I actually caught up with this space, and I feel like I'm like left age behind already. So I need to to catch up. So you have to to bear with me, gentlemen. So one thing that's not entirely clear for me, and I guess people like me as well, is what exactly is the relationship between these alternate, let's say, these different data table formats that we now have across these lake house products. And the way that seems more approachable to me to be able to get a grasp of that is, well, the relationship with Hadoop that you both pointed out at some point and HDFS. And the reason I'm saying that is that, well, because for a number of reasons, first Hadoop was, I guess, the first platform that, well, first of all, it was at some point sort of synonymous with big with big data and data lakes and all of that. And also it was the first platform that actually introduced this separation between data and compute. It, it didn't quite caught on in, in the cloud era, which is why it's sort of left behind now. However, I found interesting that there is one sort of connecting thread, let's say, to these table formats that are now prevalent. There's something called Apache hoodie, and apparently to the best of my understanding, it's, it's sort of lineage, let's say, dates back to Hadoop and its own HDFS, and it's sort of an evolution of that. Is my understanding correct? Is that the case indeed? I would say that Apache Hoodie and Delta Lake, they both continued built on what Hive built. So that whole mm -hmm. sort of like where there's a directory and then subdirectories to determine the partitioning, they both kind of leaned in on that. So they, they have more backward compatibility theoretically with with with, with hive this this has some trade offs so like iceberg completely decoupled from that need to have all your files organized into certain like sub partition folders and all that stuff and because iceberg did that it's enabled possibilities of like not makes migration easier because then you don't have to move all your files or rewrite all your files because you can just leave them where they're at. It also allows it for unique file structures, which allow it to work around certain like object storages like throttling and and access limitations. But the nice thing about like having everything in one folder is that you know the whole table is in one folder and it's much easier to let's say zip it up and then send it over email to somebody. So but I would say like I think I always I forget the exact always exactly when each one was created. But I mean, Hoodie was pretty early on over there at Uber, and its its design is very, very much sort of 
stem or you know very clearly like sort of stems from where hive was at the time they've added all sorts of different layers to it so basically you have the the folder and the, and the nested folders and then you generally have the separate folder of metadata that is organized into a variety of different indexes a metadata table a variety of different extra bloom filters all these different things that are used to help query the data faster i would say like Cody and delta both kind of use that fundamental hive structure and then built a more robust metadata structure on top of it, Iceberg completely just decided to do something completely, completely different. Okay. All right. And then another thing that's not very clear to me is the relationship of all these table formats with underlying like cloud native blob storage like S3 or, you know, Google uh, storage and so on. So do they sit precisely on top of those? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so essentially, they're agnostic as far as where you store your data. So theoretically, you could use them on Hadoop or any storage layer. So basically, what they do is they, they all of these formats, they create a standard for how metadata is written regarding referring to the files. And then that metadata is usually co-located with the files. So in a hoodie folder, Delta Lake folder, and even in most Apache iceberg tables, there's a folder, there's a data, and then there's a the metadata. But basically, instead of going directly to the data, like a traditional data lake pattern where I would just go, like in a Hive table, I would just say, hey, this folder is the directory. And then the engine would just do a, direct, a file listing of that folder and then iterate through all the files in those folders to kind of build the table. What is going to happen with like Apache Iceberg, Hoodie, and Delta, instead, the engine's going to go read this metadata and be able to use the metadata, which has a lot of aggregate statistics, to be able to determine, hey, which files are even relevant to my query. So basically, it skips the whole process of doing all these file listing operations and can build the list of files it needs to scan before it even touches any of those directories, allowing it for a much more performant scanning. Okay. Yeah, the one sure. thing I'm also going to point out is that, for instance, you have some formats that are optimized for in-memory, right? Like you have Apache Arrow. And then you have others that are far more aligned towards disk storage, right? And that would be Parquet. And there are attempts now to have common representations of data, both in memory and on, on storage, right? So that's the kind of the current holy grail that people are chasing is how do we make it so that stuff, that, and, and this is because of the need to go to tiered storage. You wanna have something because your tiers could go from in memory to SSD to you know some sort of blob storage, right? So that people really want flexibility in where and how they store their data. And if they have to do transmogrifications in real time, that kind of defeats a lot of purposes of what they're trying to do with tiered storage. So I think that that's the current paradigm that people are trying to push is, is there a best, most universal format? But again, there's always these optimizations and trade-offs because what's efficient to be stored on disk, let's say a highly compressible file, which is great for storage, might not be the best thing for in memory, right? So, so if you actually get into file formats, and there's a whole, there's hours, there's like a Carnegie Mellon level course that's available on file formats. But, but in in short, again, whenever you're optimizing for something, you're optimizing away for something else. But I, I'm very eager to see where that kind of universal sort of representation of data is taking us right now. If I think if I put myself to say in the shoes of users my actually my primary concern with any of those formats would be so great but is it actually interoperable so can i theoretically at least have you know part of my storage on s3 and then another part on azure storage and then another part on google cloud storage and somehow join all of that together if i use iceberg or hoodie or what else so something uh, else yeah yeah i mean bottom line like far as like they're just going to allow the, the store, the basically that those files, those parquet files and storage should be recognized as a table. Now, being able to connect to multiple clouds at the same time, that's going to be timid on the tool. So like a tool like, like Dremio, you can connect to those multiple clouds at the same time, and it can recognize iceberg tables or Delta Lake tables on those stores. And then you can join them together and do it just like as if it were just one big uh, database. Now, of course, there are some caveats with that, because when you're, you know, basically there'll be one cloud that's sort of your primary cloud and the other two clouds. And if you're bringing in files from all three clouds, you might run into egress costs or network costs from transferring those mm -hmm. files outside of each cloud. So that's always a consideration. It's like, can you do multi-cloud? Yes. Do you want to split your files evenly across the clouds? That might be expensive. But but platforms like Dremio, Dremio definitely believes in that story where it's not just data lake house. Like just having, being able to access your data 
as a database in the data warehouse is a good start, but no one's just gonna have all their data in one place. There's always gonna be sprinkles of data in other systems or in multiple clouds. And that's why you need like good federation that can, that can and, and, and virtualization that can, can exist at scale. And and that's that's the primary sort of like two pillars of what Remy was doing, providing you this platform for working out with the data lake house, giving that snowflake like feel on your data lake and to being able to federate and then do that virtualization at scale across different sources. Okay, so yeah, it sounds and, like it sounds like yes, you can do it, but act the actual integration or virtualization, or however you want to call it, it's it's not done on the on the protocol, the table format layer. It's actually done on the on the platform on the on the tool layer, right? Exactly, hundred percent. Right. And and again, you know, what are you optimizing for? There's a reason why there's so many CSV files still in the universe, right? They're not the most efficient way to store data, but you know, they're ubiquitous because every tool can produce CSV, right? Every tool in the world does CSV. Parquet is going to make it five to eight times more efficient. But, you know, until, let's say, a Microsoft Excel standardly outputs data in Parquet file format, <laughs> people are still going to be, be making their CSVs, right? Yeah, indeed. And, well, so since you mentioned it, and, you know, Parquet is obviously that much faster and better than, than CSV, why doesn't the why don't the Excels of, Excels of the world support Parquet right out of the... That is a good question. Right? <laughs> it would. I mean, I guess. I mean, I guess I would put it like, yeah. I don't know why. I, I would. I, I would assume that 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 feature would be added. I mean, I would say probably just because it's it fits a sp like parquet is going to come to towards a specific need for analytics when you get to a certain scale. So basically, like you know, if you're dealing with smaller data sets in an Excel spreadsheet. You can a lot of people can get go very far with just that because they're not the, the scale, the size of these files aren't that large. Then you get to a certain point where the file is getting so large, the number of records are so large, it makes a lot of sense to go to parquet. It's going to operate a lot faster. And then eventually you start splitting the data set across multiple parquet files, and then it's going to make sense. So then apply a table format like Apache Iceberg or Delta Lake on top of that to, to get their performance. So it's an issue of scale. So I would assume if I'm Microsoft and I'm thinking about Excel, how many of my customers are potentially at that scale? That that's the next feature that I want to add. I assume it would be the product sort of perspective because since it's such a general use platform, but I, I I have to imagine it'd be inevitable before there's a save as Parquet files in in Excel. It's, it's Parquet's definitely become ubiquitous at this point. I mean, it's you know like a lot of platforms like I'm sure like in I know I know in Dremio probably in Snowflake probably in other platforms you can literally just upload a CSV and then. Drop, drop it back down as parquet files within a few clicks. So, I mean, more and more tools to do that are, are coming. Yeah, I would assume, it, you know, sort of going from CSV to parquet must be, again, very, very much standardized these days. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just going to uh, give a shout out to a company called CData. C -Data. They actually do have a drop in for Excel to save as parquet. So, you can get it as an extension. I think that we'll just see how, how Microsoft you know, uh, adopts that format in the future. But but again, you can do it. And there's plenty of Python jockeys out there that know how to do this the hard way. But but you're right. I mean, this is the kind of thing that it separates the typical office worker from the data scientist, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've already sort of covered one aspect of interoperability, let's say, so the cross cloud aspect. And now I'm wondering about another one. So cross format interoperability. So if I have like my iceberg tables and my delta lake tables and my hoodie tables, is there some way to move from one to the other? There's Can a I couple, switch? Yeah, there's a couple different ways that enable that now. I'll give you some caveats at the end. But bottom line, one you can just a tool. There's also the tool answer. So again, you can use a tool like mm -hmm. like like a Dremio, like a Trino, like a there's a few other engines. That I, I all of them don't. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But lots of tools that support Iceberg Delta and Hoodie. So then you can just at that tool layer join them, work with them, transfer them between formats. But again, your tool might not. So is there a way outside of that to do that? Just a couple different options. If you're using Databricks, they have in the newest version of Delta Lake, Delta Lake 3.0. There's this feature called Uniformat. Right now, all it does is that you can have a Delta Lake table in your Unity catalog, and you can enable this. And every time, periodically, what it'll do is it'll write iceberg metadata that's accessible. So essentially, you'll have a not a one-to-one -one copy, but a close enough copy. Because if you have like 20 transactions that occur back to back to your Delta Lake table, it'll end up batching them and only writing one new snapshot to the iceberg table or the iceberg metadata. So it's not perfect, but it offers some exposure to iceberg. 
And then one house, they started this project called One Table, which creates like this utility tool that will that can transfer any table to any from any format to any format. But it's just like a one-off transaction. Like I would run, I would say, hey, here's a table, run the tool, and it outputs the file. So that's great for like migrations. That would be great for like if a if a platform wanted to build like an export tool where I can say, hey, I want to export this data set as X format. That's good for that, but it wouldn't necessarily enable hey, I'm, I'm going to use my table as all three formats all the time, or they're just completely interoperable. Just because like writing that metadata three times would probably in introduce too much latency to be doing that, to make sort of like a, a, a hey, let's just write all three every time. And then plus like the way they track snapshots can be certain, quite different in certain parts. So like, for example, like hoodie, you have to have these additional columns for like for like a, a hoodie based primary key, and it's not it's not like an optional thing. You have to have these two columns in your data, while columns like that aren't necessarily required in, in in Delta and Iceberg. So there's differences between the formats that make it where you still have to kind of work with one, but it's much easier to convert between them. And one other thing to point out is that like these formats have come out of the Apache hoodie and Delta Lake camps, and mostly to facilitate going into Iceberg just because there has been such momentum in the ecosystem for Iceberg and such growth in the Iceberg ecosystem, everyone's kind of realizing, okay, we need to make sure that our tools can still work with that ecosystem, even though we're not part of that ecosystem. Okay. And I think this is a key architectural question as to whether you leave the tables where they are in the systems where they are with some sort of federated query, hopefully some sort of metadata modeling that's common across them, schema management, Everybody knows that schema migration is one of the toughest challenges of even running a single system, right? And then trying to do schema management changes across three different systems that you're querying could, could be quite problematic, right? So that I don't think this is a solved problem. I think vendors are starting to try and make it simpler, but the alternative that the fallback is if even if there's terabytes of data in a system, but it's not formatted the way I need to then ingest that into a, another system. And for instance, like Apache Pinot does that, right? Where we are focused on real-time analytics, but if there's a gold or silver table that you need historical data to combine with your real-time data for complete view of your business, you just ingest those tables, right? And so it really depends upon the scale and scope of what you're talking about, the speed at which you need your results. And so there's not really a one size fits all best answer right now. And I think that if, when we talk about what we what we should be driving towards over the next decade, better ways of giving options to consumers, right? Data consumers, how do they want to size up these problems, and how can how can we give them predictive ways to 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 plan for these trade offs? If you do it with, let's say, a federated query, these are the costs and benefits. If you want to do a kind of like you know a hybrid table of real time and batch data. What's the trade-offs and, and advantages of that? And I think that that people just don't even, we don't even have a grammar to describe those kinds of hybrid or complex data products these days. I think that the whole concept of, let's say, data catalogs, like we do have the DCAT standard, but a lot of the standards around making a data mesh really happen don't exist yet. And I think that that's the kind of thing we owe consumers over the coming decade. It's better ways for them to understand where their data lives right now and better ways for them to understand how to plan for the consumption of their data in the future. Yeah, well, thanks, Peter, because actually yeah, the conversation was sort of naturally flowing towards uh, federated systems. And I was going to ask you precisely to share a little bit about what you do with Pinot and how do you approach this federated issue? Yeah, so I think that the answer for a lot of people is just Trino right now right they, they'll they'll make the federated query with a kind of like a higher level system like a trino there's some people that want to make graphql the lowest common denominators to be able to, to query any system so that you can hide and abstract the actual details of what the system is in the back end so that if you change from vendor to vendor the the, the, the programmers the developers themselves aren't changing their queries right but even graphql has its own limitations there are some times where you want to have a native sql query because there might be a difference in how null is handled between a Postgres and a different database, right? So I think that that's the issue is that there's also this dynamic between having a common API versus having specific semantics to get the most out of your data. Like for instance, I'll just throw this out there, like a graph database 
you you might really want to do a, a native graph database query because there's some very cool and sophisticated things you can do there that you wouldn't get out of generic SQL, right? So I really think that 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 that's an evolving thing too, is how do we federate queries? And when do we stay in our native rich semantics for a specific database designed for a specific project? Yeah, well, since you mentioned GraphQL, I think part of the, of the promise of the allure of GraphQL was precisely this being agnostic, but at the same time having like this quick and dirty, let's say interoperability layer that will take your generic GraphQL and then quickly pass it on to whatever underlying implementation you have. And in theory, you can have anything, be it a graph database or SQL or what have you. Yeah, Alex, how, how is your uh, team taking a look at that kind of concept of federating queries or staying native for semantic, you know, mm -hmm. advantages? Understood. Bottom line is like Dremio, we we do federate qu queries. But now, now we... Uh, so, like, sort of one distinction between sort of like you know what what you're doing with Apache Pinot and Star Tree or Star Tree is that you guys are like federating a lot of these like really great like real time sources. Well, like in Dremio, well, we don't have any like you know Kafka Kinesis connectors right now, but we do have connectors to pretty much databases, data warehouse, and data lakes on prem and in the cloud. So this allows people to kind of connect their data across lots of different places, and also has a, a built in semantic layer to kind of model that data. So. Generally, what Dremio hopes to be is just sort of like this unified access layer where basically wherever your data lives, you, you can connect to it, then model it virtually, which kind of gets back to sort of like what you were mentioning earlier, where basically a lot of these like database systems now, you're really just sort of dealing with this virtual layer over the actual fundamental data. Dremio aims to be sort of that data, the data lake house's sort of virtual layer above all those different data sources. So we generally, our architecture lends towards sort of the gravity being on the data lake. So like you're going to get sort of like the best architecture when most of your data is on your data lake in ideally Apache iceberg format. But there's so many different possible permutations of how you could use Dremio. Like I've seen one way the federation on Dremio has been used a lot is one for a prem on-prem to cloud migrations. So companies will have a Hadoop cluster on-prem. They want to move to cloud, but the problem is for the most part, a lot of the tooling on-prem is completely different than the tooling on cloud. Uh, there aren't really many tools that go through both. And oftentimes, tools like Trino has some flexibility there, but oftentimes at scale, it can be a little, little tricky. Like great for ad hoc, little, little gets a little trickier at very large scale uh, queries. So with Dremio, they would first bring in Dremio connected to the on-prem cluster. They immediately see like the performance benefits. But what, more importantly, what they do is they create this unified access point. So from the end user, they're just accessing data from Dremio. They don't really care where the data exists. They're just accessing the views that were curated. They're curating their own views from the data that they have been granted access to. And then what happens, they'll move the data over to the cloud and then they can just adjust the, the queries in those views. So now query the objects, the object storage copy of that. And then basically there's it's a frictionless migration from the end user's point of view. So there's no disruption and no having the need to retrain your, your fundamental end users at the end, making those, make those kind of data movements really easy. So that's a popular use case. So Federation has, one, can allow you to do ad hoc analytics, which is generally what most people think of when they think like federated queries. But again, it enables like all sorts of different types of data movements. It enables data mesh because then your different domains and your different teams can curate from their own data sources. You, they, not everyone has to agree and like, oh, we're all going to store our data here. We can connect those different sources and then curate those data products in one unified semantic layer. So Dremio really tries to kind of create that one layer that unifies your data where it is and allows you to so bring in data from everywhere, deliver it everywhere and do it, do it with performantly because there's this feature called reflections that I won't, I won't go too deep into it now, but it really, really kind of fixes the scale issue when you start trying to do virtualization at scale by basically automating away the lots of the, the lots of the difficult materializations you would normally be doing otherwise. But so federation is a very big part of what we do and what we think about are right now it's mostly connecting to the raw data sources. So not much real time yet. So that, that, that'd be a, like a great place for a platform like Startree and Apache Pinot. And then, so there's some great options when it comes, and that's a great thing about the data lake house. You can use multiple tools for your multiple use cases and bring them all together and, and be able to have sort of this unified data platform that doesn't require 20 copies of the data. You're operating on a single copy of the data across multiple tools. And that's, that's this whole modular multi-platform promise. And in that kind of architecture that Alex just talked about and Peter, what would the, the role of Pinot be like? doing 
analytics on incoming real-time streaming data and then sort of delivering them to the to the lake house yeah, well probably we'd be ingesting from the lake house so probably what would happen mm -hmm. is let's so let's presume upstream you have an oltp type system right and it's probably being fed from maybe mobile devices or something on the edge right iiot or something so some oltp system is getting information and it's doing individual row based transactions and it's probably doing that at maybe a hundred thousand maybe a million operations per second and then from that there's going to be change data capture and like for instance debezium is a common way of doing change data capture and that and debezium is going to be feeding all of those changes happening in real time straight on into a kafka topics or pulsar or red panda right it's going to go into a real-time event streaming system now that in and of itself may not be sufficient and so you might have stream processing also happening in real time and flink is decorating and annotating and sanitizing and doing a lot of transformations on those real-time events, enriching them. And there's probably going to be two consumers. One is going to be the batch data warehouse, you know, running the critical business reports that, that need to happen. But those are going to be happening over the span of minutes, hours, or even a day or more, right? And then on top of that, a different consumer would be an Apache Pinot, which is watching for these real-time signals happening at a million events per second. And so part of it will be informed from, again, probably a silver or gold table from the data warehouse, because it needs to know not the whole complete history of everything, but maybe like the last week or last 30 days of information on, on, on what's going on with your enterprise. And so that batch data will be ingested like StarTree has a data manager, which automates this whole process on top of Apache Pinot. And so it, it combines and makes a hybrid table out of both your real time and your historical data for a complete view of really important thing that you need to monitor in real time. And then for instance, we can do anomaly detection on top of that as well. So when is, and, and it's not just like a parametric, like, you know, if it's greater than this or less than that, that's very simple statistical, very simple like parametrics, but we do statistical analysis. So it does this fall within your interquartile range, right? Or is this beyond that kind of stuff? So we use statistical analysis to watch for when things truly are an anomaly. So you're not just constantly hammered with, with false positives, right? So that's the kind of thing that's really important for a business who's watching, let's say their Black Friday sales. You anticipate, you want to see Black Friday go big, right? It should be falling out of your normal Monday to Friday business. <laughs> and, and the question is, does this equal or exceed our last Black Friday? And if so, by how much, right? And you don't have until Tuesday to figure out what's going on on Cyber Monday, you know, or if you're delivering pizzas, you don't have until after lunch hour to figure out how many people need to be delivering pieces during lunch hour. Like you need to solve some of these problems in real time. And there's just no, there's no way that you can wait for a batch analytics report. It has to be solved in real time. So I'm trying to wrap my head around how is that different from the kind of processing you can get from, you know, something like the platforms that you mentioned, like Flink or Red Panda or Kafka sure. even. Just as an example, OLTP systems are fantastic row stores and you can do all sorts of like row-based caching and there's tons of caching available when you're talking about row-based stuff. But with analytics, you're probably looking for really fast aggregations, right? And here you don't have the luxury of just cubing everything all the time and keeping it all in memory. You would die, right? So as an example, there's a specialized kind of index for Apache Pinot known as the Star Tree Index, which is where my company gets its name. And that means that you can do fast aggregations without having to do a full blown all dimensions by all dimensions cubing. And it's efficient and it's fast and it's our secret sauce. It's why Apache Pinot is Apache Pinot, is that Star Tree Index. But for instance, if you're trying to get the that cab to that street corner like Uber does, you know, they're trying to get like a person who's got a pin drop on a map connected with their car, their ride. So there's beyond just the star tree index, there's an H3 index for geospatial indexing, right? So flexible indexing on top of data is also a key requirement. Not everything is a forward or reverse index. <laughs> we got a lot of people doing a lot more kinds of, in so the exact same data may be indexed multiple different ways, depending upon what you're trying to get out of it. Are you trying to get aggregations? 
Are you trying to get pin drops to match within a certain radii? You know, all of this is 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 the same data indexed different ways for different use cases at the same way. All right. Cool. Now let's get back to my favorite actual topic, as you must have figured by now. So interoperability. You you've we've talked a little bit about how it works or it kind of works, you know, on the on the table format, let's say, level, but there's also two other very important aspects for which some I don't think we have adequate answers, but let's try and address them anyway. So we've talked about sem the semantics layer and we've talked about governance as well. So are there is there any kind of way besides the specific tool kind of layer, let's say, is there any kind of standardized way to address semantics and governance in this multi table format world? Bottom line, when it comes to like, for the most part, semantics are going to have to generally come like a semantic layer is going to generally come from some sort of tool because generally that's not the way all the formats work is it's generally the metadata has information about the table but not about the overall catalog of tables to be able to kind of document the semantics of the con of all those tables and how they relate to each other at least a standard format of doing that doesn't exist yet there is something like that but only for iceberg tables so something called the project called nessie which creates this sort of like open source catalog that not that that allows you to not only track and, and version individual iceberg tables, but also version views. So that can um, that that can almost make a semantic layer portable. Always the issue there is, is your views are SQL and the SQL syntax of every tool isn't the same. So even if the SQL is portable via this catalog, there's some challenges there. So it'll be difficult to kind of create like a, there would have to be sort of like a, I mean, I guess ANSI SQL is sort of like, you have to just make sure that everything sticks to ANSI. <laughs> but far as interoperability in the catalog that's getting there like nessie eventually will have delta lake support it's tried to have delta lake support in the past but delta, the delta lake project never took the pull request but that that project is open source and would eventually kind of create that sort of portable ability to create bring tables of multiple formats so far as the semantics now as far as governance same thing also there nessie also allows you to actually create governance rules where you can make certain branches accessible to the users because basically what would happen is that each user would get a token from nessie that they use to access the catalog from whatever tool whether it's spark trino gremio whatever and then technically hey their token may or may not be able to access that that item in the catalog so theoretically as the nessie project builds up that actually does create a layer where you can kind of make semantics and governance portable uh, but at the end of the day like the way thing at the way at this current state of things it's still fairly tool driven i mean i guess the best you could do is you could also lock down the files so basically you know access rules on on your cloud storage it doesn't matter what the format's in if they can't access the files they can't access the table you can do that across you know any format but you should still do file level permissions on top of your table level permissions just for the extra security but that's kind of where things are at. Like I would, I, the Nessie projects, I think the tool and then competitively like Unity catalogs also trying to do that, but per, per, primarily for like Delta Lake tables and try to create like a more portable catalog for their Delta Lake tables. So those will be the two projects that I think are trying to solve that problem. And then Dremio has a productization of that Nessie open source project called Dremio Arctic, which is our internal catalog that leverages that. And so basically you, those tables that you create in Dremio are portable to all these other tools if you wanted to. So I was going to give a shout out actually to the federal government. I've been taking a look at what they're trying to do, the UK government there. And in fact, I'll, I'll share this link. It's at the W3C. It's called uh, DCAT. DCAT 3 is their latest version. And it's an attempt to define a data catalog and vocabulary for data catalogs. And it's, I don't think I've seen it widespread enough. I don't think that businesses have been embracing it the same way that governments have, but they now have, for instance, they have Freedom of Information Act and a whole bunch of other kinds of directives about how to share pro data products that the government has. And so they relied heavily upon this to like say like, well, here's a data source that you can get. Here's a bunch of files in a file system, you know, and how do we describe what these data products are? And, and I think that this is, again, this is the, the next thing that I think is an industry we can tackle is better defining both batch data products, but also real-time streaming products where these things might be changing. If, if we have schema problems managing real-time analytics, then you know the data products from those real-time systems also needs to have their own semantics to it, especially as we you know con continue to enrich things. 
like for instance, the the Kafka topic when it first gets ingested may be highly different than the data product that comes out after it's been through stream processing and Flink, et cetera, right? So this is just an example, I think, of a, a, a stab at it. I, I don't know that DCAT is going to win, but it's definitely an interesting uh, attempt to, to, to herd these cats. Because I think that one of the things I have seen in my career here, I've been in Silicon Valley since 1989, is the move away from standard. For instance, even when we talk about ANSI SQL, how null handling happens. <laughs> If it was all the same, we'd all handle no the same, right? But but even just that an, is an illustrative of it. Just illustrates how far we we can gink standards as particular vendors, right? And I think that there's still attempts like here for the W3C and from other standards bodies to make it so that we are interoperable. But I think that vendors have, there are billions of dollars at stake. And a lot of these big organizations really do want to make the standard not quite standard so they have an advantage in the marketplace. And I think that that's, if anything, I would like to go back to our old school roots where we had stronger interoperability standards. And I think that the real place where this has to be driven from is the customers themselves. If they said, listen, all you cloud vendors, all you data warehouse vendors, you all get a room and you solve it and then we'll consume it, but you make it solved. Right. I think that if we had stronger pre presentation from the customers, there would be a lot more drive for interoperability than from the vendors themselves. Yeah, well, you're right about DCAT. And actually, since semantics and you know data management and knowledge management happens to be my, my cup of tea, this is something I'm familiar with. And there's actually a, a ton of other like standard vocabularies that could potentially be used for, for that purpose. But I think it all comes down to, to what you said. It's not really about having lack of technical solutions. It's about, you know, which vendor or its tool provider just going out and doing their own thing, basically. And, and I'm saying that is coming from a vendor. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to be honest with ourselves and with our customers that we need to do a better job as an industry. Yeah, I mean, it's totally understandable why, you know, vendors would like to, to do their own thing for a number of reasons. It doesn't necessarily have to be like, you know, lock in. People just generally think, oh, okay, I can I can produce a better solution to that problem. But, well, maybe, but the, problem, the other problem you're generating by doing that is that, well, in the end, there's no interoperability and, yeah, it's just kind of... Right. Well, I mean, I think that there were attempts to try and make standards back in the 2014, 2011 days. I took a look at some earlier attempts at this for various elements of, of the database industry. And, and you can't standardize too quickly because then you put a chilling effect on innovation. And there's a tremendous amount of innovation. So if anything, though, what we should be taking a look at is ways to make extensible standards. I mean, the IETF hit this kind of well with Ethernet <laughs> and with, you know, TCP IP, I think they did okay too, you know, where, where you make it such that your current standards do not preclude advancement and innovation, right? You say, this is the standard for 2023 as is, and we will build an extensible grammar on top of what we, what we can currently do. And if you take a look at just, for instance, OAuth, right? OAuth 1.0, that completely got pretty, you know, it got, it got hammered. And OAuth 2.0 is significantly different. There's a lot of stuff that's not allowed in OAuth 2.0 that was in OAuth 1.0. And I think that we should, as data systems providers, we should not be afraid to try and work together. And maybe we'll get it wrong in 2023, but we should try and at least work together and then if we need to revise for 2025, 2027, and 2030 and beyond, we, we need to be able to have those kinds of gut checks, interoperability discussions, and, and do it with an eye for the benefit of the customer, not just our own bottom lines. We shouldn't be using data formats and query languages to lock people in. Yeah, agreed. I mean, you know, there's, there's plenty of room for healthy competition in terms of implementation and what use cases you optimize for and... I don't know, marketing even and what have you, but that should be not a part of it, in my humble opinion. Fair enough. Okay, so I don't know if we've actually, let's say, answered the uh, the initial question at least. So where is this six, what is this sixth platform going to be like? But I think we've addressed a number of questions. And since we're kind of coming closer to, to wrapping up, let's let's just 
you know, I'm just going to ask you point blank. So do you think there's going to be such a thing as a sixth platform, let's say? And if yes, what do you think it's going to look like? I would say yes. I mean, you're, we're already starting to see it. I mean, that's this is essentially Dremio's whole thesis of, of there being sort of this open lake house where it's not just operating on the data lake, but, you, you know, several different tools, several different sources, like basically a, a being a unifying layer in all of that. So that way you can have that sort of more modular approach with a nice, easy base on it. So we're seeing customers embrace that, mainly either because they have a need to federate different sources, or they really want to just do more with Apache Iceberg on their data lake, or you know they want to improve their BI performance with the features like reflections. Like they are embracing sort of this sort of like, hey, let's let's do more with our data lake, let's do more with a variety of tools in a more modular way using open formats like Apache Iceberg, like Apache Arrow. I like Apache Parquet and seeing how all these can unify to create, you know, a greater level of interoperability. Of course, still imperfect interoperability, but a better, a, a much a best, better state of things than in the past. Yeah, I, I don't know that there's going to be a one system to bind all the customers, right? It's not going to be like the one ring. I think that we're still going to see a drive towards clusters of clusters, systems of systems, where you're going to have some things that are focused again on OLTP-ish lo workloads. There's going to be some OLAP-ish workloads. There's going to be some batch workloads. There's going to be some real-time workloads. It's and I think that this is going to be driven by the customers to they're they're going to want these things to work better together. They're going to want them to feel more like Lego bricks that that snap together easily. They're not going to want it to be like an IKEA piece of furniture that you know comes with a hex wrench right with some assembly required there's going to be a lot more drive towards the automation of integration but i don't know that customers want to walk away from the last generation where they were locked into a vendor to a new generation where they're locked into a vendor they're going to want to mix and match components a lot more than ever before they're going to want to be able to put in their own innovation where they can because that's a competitive advantage advantage a trade secret some way that they're skinning the cat that isn't open source. And I think that we're just going to see a lot more hybridization than we're going to see everybody roll over to a single monolithic model. Yeah, well, I know that that's what I would like to see for one. And yes, I should, I should have clarified when I was, in my mind, uh, at least when I was talking about this notion of the six platform, I wasn't necessarily thinking of like, oh, okay, so it's like this vendor that's going to come up and, you know, take over the world or something. No, I was more thinking about along the lines of something that, that like you just described, Peter. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I personally don't think that we have sufficient grammar to describe what that's going to be. I've been calling it federated data systems. But federation already is a very complex namespace that's already like, you know, again, federated queries has a meaning, a semantic meaning. Federated learning in AIML has a, a semantic meaning. But I, I, so if other people have a better way to describe the platform, some people call it a data mesh, but I think a data mesh today is still too conceptual. Like I, if you were to tell a coder, make me a data mesh, there is no model for it, right? There is no standard for it. So I think that we need to come up with a better way of describing this language of interoperability. And uh, again, DCAT's an example, just one example of how you semantically describe these beasts that we're building. But I think we need to come up with other ways of saying what these systems are so that they can machine to machine explore each other, understand what they store in within each other. They know whether it's a dead end to even connect to you or not. Like we and we need to have a language, a grammar for the systems themselves to 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 understand each other. So that's what I'm looking for for the next decade. Thanks for sticking around. For more stories like this, check the link in bio and follow Link Data Orchestration.